Hello and welcome to Sweet Spot DFS. This is a DFS preview for the 2021 RBC Heritage. Now, before we actually get in the video, I want to remind you guys there are timestamps in the description below. Also on YouTube, that progress bar is cut up into segments. If you hover over it, it'll tell you what those timestamps are. So you can get to any part of the video as quick as you want. Um, on the topic of quickness, I'm I'm it's my goal to try to make this the quickest preview that I've done yet. Uh, not because I don't have a lot of information to give, but I want to try to see how efficient I can be at doing this. I feel like I kind of double up on a lot of the things that I usually talk about. So I'm going to change the format a little bit. Um, I'm still going to be looking at course history and recent form, but I think I'm going to start with the buckets first and then go into, you know, who has the best course history and who has the best recent form uh, and kind of attack it at that route. Same goes with salaries and optimal lineups. Um, but yeah, you again, you can find everything in the description below. Below, First thing I want to cover, um, I want to actually go over the tournament fact sheets. So the tournament fact sheets gives us a really good general information of the tournament. It obviously gives you the golf course that it's being played at, the yardage, what type of grass it is. Sometimes the stint meter, obviously it shows stint meter here. Uh, but it's a good way to gauge where we want to start building our lineups from. Or at least get us thinking about how we want to build our lineups. So, very first thing, we're, this is the RBC Heritage. Obviously, you know that. We are at Harbor Town Golf Links. We've played this golf course quite a bit on the PGA Tour. I shouldn't say we, but obviously the PGA Tour has. It's at Hilton Head, South Carolina. Um... And you obviously can see the dates. Not that big of a deal. It's a par 71, 36 on the front nine, 35 on the back nine, 3,100 yards. That's pretty basic. Um, if you're going to ask me on on what is your average yardage for par 71s, it's going to be around 7,100 yards. Maybe 72, so this might be a little shorter, but pretty much on par uh, of what would be average distance. Stint meter 11.5. Um, I feel like that's pretty slow because if I recall, these greens aren't as slopey um, as they, let's, let's say as like a, uh, a master's tournament, you know, where you can't really get the stint meter too fast at Augusta because of how undulating the greens are. But I don't remember them being undulating here, like not a lot of undulation. So 11.5 to me feels like it's a little slower. Um, which I would say probably make the better putters that much better. I, I feel like the slower the greens, the further the good putters can separate themselves from the bad putters. Um, and I guess a quick rundown on that is fast greens don't require to bring the putter head back that far. So any technique issues aren't going to be as prevalent in that type of putting stroke on fast greens. Also, you know, a lot of putts are defensive. So your good putters can't be as aggressive. Um, everyone is basically putting, you know, defensively on fast green. So I do think if you want to wait someone over another guy, let's say you have a tiebreaker and you need to decide, you can use a putting stat. I don't mind that, but don't go all in on that. We're definitely going to find some bad putters at the top of the leaderboard here at the end of the tournament. It just happens every single week. So don't get too caught up on that. We have number of holes, waters, and play is 18. That's crazy. I have not yet been able to do a, uh, a course breakdown. I do want to include that on my previews going forward. Um, I just don't feel like it's uh, a good thing to have it during the strategy video. But yeah, I definitely want to um, include that there. But 18 holes. I, I'd have, again, I'd have to double check. I have no idea if there's like a creek that runs through every single um, every single hole or what. And that's my bad for not having that information for you guys. But I definitely will tomorrow during the, uh, the course breakdown. I'll mention it there. Here's the more interesting piece to me is the turf grass. Um, it is Tiff Eagle Bermuda grass overseeded with POA on the greens. And then you can see the tees are also overseeded, but not the fairways. And... That's probably because fairways, they're not too concerned with filling them in. And for the tees, they probably want it to look a little better on TV. Or perhaps there's just not a lot of sun that gets on some of the tee boxes. That's probably that's probably the main thing. Um, to be 
overseeded with ryegrass. But yeah, for you know, if you're looking for putting splits on a certain type of grass type, this is the time of the year. I'm guessing Bermuda in South Carolina is, is starting to sprout and grow. Um, it does feel like it's a hybrid mix, you know, where you could look at both Bermuda and Poa. But it's really difficult. I mean, if if the superintendent is telling us that it's overseed with Poa, that means it's, it's not optimal growing conditions for Bermuda. Meaning we're not going to see, like, Bermuda is not going to be that prevalent. I think somebody on my Twitter had told me that uh, Bermuda is the dominant grass. Well, I don't know. It's too hard to tell. We'll look at the weather coming up here. Um, the weather forecast to see. You need 70 like for optimal Bermuda growing temperatures, you need 75 degrees on average per day. That means from sun up to, it means from 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. It needs to average 75. So you're looking at high temps during the day in the 90s, or let's say in the 80s, 85. And you want your night temperatures around 65, 70. If that's not really happening, if your average temperature isn't reaching 75 throughout the entire day, um, the Bermuda just isn't going to grow at the rate that you would need to have a, a full functioning golf course with that type of grass. So I don't know. Uh, I do know that the temperatures aren't there yet in South Carolina. Uh, I haven't looked at the, you know, 90 day weather history for South Carolina, but this month, this week, the high is 75. So I can tell you right now, average temperatures aren't there. So that's my little piece. If you're going to definitely look at those grass stats, I think you got to weight POA a little bit more heavily than Bermuda. That's just, that's my take on it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, fairways are overseas with ryegrass. I don't know why I didn't see that before. You guys probably caught it, but. You can also see some of the additional notes. Co uh, the course was all Bermuda, gra Bermuda grass for the last year's event in June. Remember, it was in June last year, uh, which obviously is a couple months ahead of right now. And therefore, that makes sense why it was Bermuda. Um, it was overseeded this year. It's it's good to note that in 2019, it was also overseeded, but in 2018, it wasn't. So I don't know if 2018 was a hotter year and there was no overseed or if the superintendent just simply forgot to mention that information. You can see uh, there was a, went and, a wet and cold winter. And then obviously play had a lot. There was a lot of play on this golf course during the pandemic. So that basically telling you it got beat up uh, quite a bit. So yeah, I definitely think we have to go with the POA, you know, reading all that information. If it was beat up, that means the, you know, it just, it means growing conditions aren't optimal. And if you are not having the heat to do that, then it's definitely not growing that great. The course architect, architect is Pete Dye. That is, that is very important to note. Pete Dye creates golf courses that you don't see on tour with any other architects. So it is something to look at. You know, I like looking at average finishing positions with Pete Dye uh, golf courses. I'm definitely going to be talking about that. Uh, in this preview video, if you want to see that, just look at the grass stats uh, for the, the description below and the timestamps. Um, so we'll definitely get there. But let's go ahead and look at the weather. So obviously I have Hilton Head, South Carolina on the screen. As I scroll down, we can see 78 degrees for Tuesday and Wednesday, going to 77 uh, on Thursday, 70 degrees on Friday. Um, and really it, these two days are the important days to me because this is where the cut is going to be dependent on Saturday and Sunday. We won't know. And, and the other thing too is Thursday and Friday, we're going to be given the set tee times. So we're going to be able to, you know, highlight which golfers have an optimal tee time compared to the other guys. Saturday and Sunday, we won't know. They obviously get re repaired, um, every day after Friday, after the cuts made depending on who's the lowest guy in the clubhouse or the lowest guy going out the next day. Um, so yeah, I don't really so much care about Saturday or Sunday, but Thursday, Friday, that is where it's important to me. Um, we can see some PM showers. I don't know when that's actually going to start. Showers for the afternoon hours. So 
I mean, we have to remember, like, rain isn't that big of a deal when it comes to playing golf for the pros. Wind is way more important. And you can see it's pretty benign. Thursday, Friday, there really isn't one that's greater than the other. I guess five or 10 to 15 miles an hour on Thursday, 5 to 10 miles an hour on Friday. So... I guess that doesn't really hurt like Friday afternoon times. I mean, that's kind of where we're looking at. If, if, if we're looking at wind, we probably want to be wary or leery of afternoon tea times with a lot of wind. Cause usually the morning at most places around the U S aren't as windy as the afternoon. So I don't know. That's getting a little too cute for my taste. I I'm not too worried about uh, temperature or wind, but again, to kind of, hammer down on the whole optimal grass growing conditions again as you see i mean we only have a couple days a few days that are over 75 degrees and this is the 10 day forecast obviously that can change but you know it's it's not it's it's close but it's not quite there um i'm guessing when you know day like daytime temperatures get to 80 degrees that's when um the gr uh, grass growing conditions are going to be best so yeah i definitely would say looking at poa grass for greens you know for putting that's probably the best best route to go okay rbc heritage the i like looking at past results because what this will do is give us kind of an idea of you know how tough this golf course is and what type of golfer we want to pursue you know build our lineups around what i mean by that is if we had a 22 under you know winner say every single year we know this is a birdie fest and therefore we would want to get golfers or we would want to roster golfers who are better equipped at playing at a birdie fest golf course so obviously what i would say is research you you know it, whatever fantasy tool you have look at target score or, or winning score of 20 under or better and then look at everyone's average finishing position and see if there's one, you know, if there are golfers who do play better than, say, at a grinded out golf course or a grinded out tournament where the score is closer to 12 under, which we kind of already see here. Um, personally, to me, since this was played in June on Bermuda grass where the weather was warmer, uh, I don't know what the wind was like in 2020, but obviously you can see scoring was easier for everybody. Now, if we look at every other year that actually had this tournament in April, we can see average winning score was 12, 13, 9. It did reach 18 in 2015, but it hovers around that, say, 9 to 13 under range. And I think that's probably what we're going to see this year. I think it's going to be somewhere between... I mean, I, I think this year has just been different overall because there just aren't that many spectators that provide, you know, a little bit of pressure. I would say we're going to see a target score around 11 to 14 under. That's my guess. So I think it's going to be north of the average uh, for every year except for 2020. So it's going to just open it up to everybody in the field. Now, I don't think you really want to target birdie makers and you don't really want to target golfers who avoid bogey, basically. That's um, that's basically your grinded out golfers, those who avoid bogeys but don't make a lot of birdies. Um so yeah, it's going to be open to everybody, which doesn't really help. Again, I said this during the Masters. I said all that. It deliberately wastes your time because <laughs> it's just when we have something like this, it, it, it opens it up to everybody. So let's move on. Um, the next piece of information that I want to go to is looking at salaries. Before we even create our lineup, we have to understand, I mean, it's best to look at salaries that show up inside the top 10 to see what is the most frequent salary. And a, and a little bit of this too is our favorites, you know, do favorites do well at this golf course or is this dominated by say mid range to low tier golfers? Um, and really the answer to that is, yeah, it's, you, you definitely want to target nine K golfers and eight K golfers. When we look, I mean, I have all the salaries from 2020 going back to 2018. Uh, that's all the DraftKings information that I have. Uh, hopefully, if there's a 2017 tournament that I haven't yet captured, I can. 
Um, cause it, it's always best to have as much information as possible. But if we just look at 2018 to 2020 and we look at golfers who are 11 K and above, I mean, we have one instance that shows up inside the top 20. Otherwise we have zero inside the top five and top 10. And we had a total of five throughout the last three years. So that's not a lot, you know, usually the best golfers aren't coming to this tournament after the masters. Um, and this is usually always played after the Masters. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, so yeah, 11K, not the greatest. But if we even look at 10 to 11K, I mean, we have one guy inside the top five that was a 10K golfer, three inside the top 10, and three inside the top 20. We had 10 total, so we have a 10% frequency rate of 10K golfers inside the top five, 30% inside top 10. Um, that's not the greatest, especially when we see higher percentages for nine and eight K golfers right below it. So there is an 18% frequency rate of nine K golfers finishing inside the top five. Same goes with eight K golfers, pretty darn close 17.24. Those are very high percentages for nine K and eight K ranges. And obviously if you look at the, you know, top 10 percentage, this is what I do all the buckets off of. It's nearly 60%, uh, which is extremely high. And then you can see what it looks like for 7 to 8K and below 7K. But of course, our numbers are much higher with those types of groups because that's just, that's how DraftKings salaries are. And it makes sense because these, a lot of these guys really don't have, you know, their odds of winning a tournament aren't that great. One other piece that we can also look at, uh, I do want to mention, you can see the the count for the, the salaries that show up inside the top 10 the most, as well as the count for the salaries that show up inside the top five the most. Now, I don't specifically look at just these salaries. I give them ranges basically. So I'm I'm always looking between 71 or seven to seven, three, or seven to seven, yeah, seven to seven, three, then seven, four to seven, seven, and then seven, eight to seven, well, seven, four to seven, six, seven, seven to seven, nine. So if you see a lot of those salaries, like seven, three, seven, two, even six, nine, we can say a low 7K, high 6K golfer is probably someone we want to make sure we have in our lineup. Um, and it's funny, you don't really see any 10K golfers up here, but we do see a 10-9 inside the top five, uh, as well as a 10K golfer. But you can see how many more show up inside the top 10 for the other salaries. You know, 8-9 to 9-3. I mean, you could include that in kind of a range by itself or maybe... 8.6 to eight nine, so definitely want a high eight eight k golfer and a low nine k golfer. I mean, it just shows up inside the top ten that much more. It's it's not worth it, or I shouldn't say it's not worth it. It's it's you know worth it to play a nine k and an eight k guy. One other thing I, I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but you know when we look at the average salary for top five, top ten, top twenty, I always look at top ten. Uh, DraftKings allows you $8,300 per player uh, to create lineups with. When the top 10 average salary is below that $8,300, it's telling you one of two things. Favorites aren't doing well at this golf course, and you probably want to leave money on the table. Um, this is, I mean, when we go to the optimal lineups, which let's do that right now. I'm going to go into 2020 or 2018. Now, my optimal lineups are based off of finishing position. I don't have DraftKings points for 2017, but if we look at the top six guys, you can fit them into a, into a lineup. That equals 47,800, and that's everyone who finishes inside the top, the top five. Um, I always like to make like a realistic lineup. So what I have here is I have uh, Ian Poulter highlighted. It says replace Horschel with Cantley, or It says Cantley, but it should say Poulter. Uh, I originally saw uh, Cantley first and just automatically assumed he was the guy to choose from. But I always like to try to find a lineup close to 50,000. And the way to do that is to have Poulter, Simpson, DeChambeau, and, and these guys. This equals 49,900. So we could create a pretty darn close lineup to 50,000. And it requires two 9K golfers, two 8K golfers, a 7, and a 6. Well, let's go to 2019. When we look at the optimal lineup here... Again, I don't have DraftKings points, so it's just going by finishing position. Um, the six golfers I've highlighted, 
equal up to be $47,000 used on DraftKings. So then I, I try to create a realistic lineup. And I couldn't find anything closer than 49100 You know, I could get cute and try to grab like Webb Simpson down here at 93. But, you know, with him being 16th place, I don't know how close that was on DraftKings points. And I don't know if that would have won a GPP. But we could say, okay, Webb. I mean, we want Kuchar. We probably want Kuchar. Or we need Kuchar and Cantlay as well as CT Pan. Um, and then going from here, I mean, we could grab these two 6K golfers. And that equals, that equals 49,000. 100 so kind of already what my realistic lineup was outside of that because i think what i have here is replace shane lowry so it's kevin streelman and ian poulter that equals forty nine thousand one hundred. so again you know that kind of there's there's really no easy way to get there without like leaving out a lot of guys so the five golfers that i have highlighted right now it was a 10k 9k another 9k 8k 6k i have 5500 dollars left i can't do this this doesn't work um if i were to select screwman i want to find someone 7600 somewhere around 7600 you can see a ton of 6k golfers are right here i can't find that 7k guy rafa cabrera bale is, is the only guy i could do that with so i guess rafa um ct pan Kucher, Cantlay, Piercy, I suppose. I'm going to have to. And now I can select someone that's $9,100. I mean, I guess Poulter is really the only choice. Or can I go Streelman to Webb? No, that's more than six golfers. Yeah, I mean, it's it's Poulter, right? And this is, what am I doing wrong? That's 49,500. So that would, in, that would include a 10K, a 9K, an 8K, seven and two sixes. Now, as I was doing this, I was like, man, it seems like you can, you can have two 9K golfers and an 8K golfer. Because obviously, Kucher's at 10 flat. Um, if we look at the highest price, uh, golfers in in the field for 2019 we see your typical five golfers 10k and above uh, and then it goes into the 9ks you know I'll, uh, i'm kind of making this work in my my benefit by trying to say he's a 9k golfer but in all reality he, he is a 10k golfer we always see about five golfers inside the 10k range so in this instance, there was a 10, a 9, and an 8. Um, and I think that's important because I believe you want a 9K golfer and an 8K golfer, no matter what. Like, you should lock your lineups into doing a 9 and an 8K golfer. And I think your third one should be somewhere between 8 to 10K. So anyone inside the 8 to 10K range, and then fill in the rest with whomever. You know, two 7s and a 6, a 7 and two 6s leave money on the table, like that's uh, definitely a way to do it. And then the last year we can look at was, again, this was in June, really don't have any recent form. Uh, we probably have way more like elite golfers in this field than we've ever seen at an RBC Heritage before because this was the second event back after COVID. So we have Rory in it, Justin Thomas, Bryson, Rom, Shoffley, Morikawa, Sung J M, Matsuyama, obviously Matsuyama just won the Masters this year, but last year wasn't looking the greatest. Um, where Webb ended up being nine thousand dollars, and like he had one of the best course histories coming into this event. I mean, he was within the top five or top twenty of best course history in the field, uh, and he was nine k. That's usually if if the other golfers aren't here, if these guys aren't here, Webb is probably he's definitely in the ten k range. For sure. Uh, but obviously, he was in the 9K range. And you can see none of the favorites really did that well. Now, we did have Justin Thomas and Bryson both finish inside the top 10. But they were not inside the optimal lineup. And this, I actually had DraftKings 4. DraftKings points 4. So you can see on the screen that the guys I have highlighted, the 6. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This would be 6 right here. Those 6 guys were 
the optimal lineup as well as the uh, Millie Maker winning lineup. And it equaled 49,900. Well, we have an 8K golfer, a 9K golfer, someone really close to 9, and, and two other 8Ks. So like a complete balanced build with a 7-4. Um, I mean, there's no reason to go outside of looking for this, but if I wanted to and say I want to get rid of you know, an 8K and a 9K to include a 10K golfer, um, I could do someone from that was sixty nine hundred dollars. So I could go down here to Dylan Fratelli, and this was this would equal forty nine thousand eight hundred. So again, you'd want a nine k, an eight k. You'd want one floating between eight to ten k. Obviously, that'd be my Bryson pick, and it allows me to pick another eight k golfer, but eight flat. Um, I don't know. To me, it's it's definitely wanting to choose a nine k and an eight k golfer for sure, um, and then maybe. I almost wanted to tell you guys we want to pick two 9K golfers, but this year really didn't prove that, like something like that was doable. But again, the field was so much different because this was a different circumstance. If we look at 2019 and 2018, yeah, I think maybe it's a 10-9-8 type of build, um, but I, I'm not going to start 10-9-8. I'm going to start two nines and an eight. And then just see what my optimizer is going to build out from there. Um, and in fact, I did do that and I left $700, $700 on the table. So my dummy lineup right now has $700 on the table. Um, and I think that's probably where we're going to have to go. Okay, let's move on. Uh, that was actually longer than I wanted it to be. So there goes my quickest um, video I could do. But... I'm not going to go into course history in recent form and talk about who has the best. Instead, what I want to do is actually get into uh, the bucket summary. And this will give us kind of the answers. Uh, and then we'll look going further from there. Um, so again, bucket system. This is a frequency model, basically, showing you of golfers that fit inside a, a, a particular range. So... Let's just take this course history four bucket. If a golfer is coming into this tournament with a course history between one and 20, so that's their average finishing position at this event, they're going to fit under this bucket. Uh, and really it's under this range. And I total up every golfer who finishes inside the top 10 dating back to 2013 that comes in with that bucket. And then obviously from there, I rank all of these buckets. So just to give you those ranges, it's 1 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 plus, and, and then no course history. Um, and I, you know, rank them based off of how many of them show up inside the top 10. And from there, I assign those numbers, those ranks, what you see here, to the golfers on my DraftKings page, which I usually talk about during the strategy video. But for this, what we're going to do is your number one bucket for course history are, believe it or not, golfers coming in with absolutely no course history. So it says did not play, but obviously this is no course history. Eight, we've seen 18 instances of top 10 finishers having no course history. So just by that alone, that's why it's number one. The next one would be golfers coming in with that 40 to 60 course history, followed by golfers coming in with that 20 to 40 course history and then golfers with the 1 to 20. Now, another way to read this, okay, sure, those are our rankings based off of the, the frequency, just the raw totals. But how about our mins and maxes? You know, what is the least amount of times it shows up any given year? Well, we can see ones all across the board for five, or two, three, four, and five, and then two for did not play. That's insane. And I guess if I want to validate this, because I kind of do, I'm not, I don't know if I fully trust that. I can go come to here, and this is my course history bucket, and just look all the way across. Sure, I see at least one there, at least one there, at least one there, at least one there, and at least one there as well. So yeah, it it's pulling that data absolutely correctly. That's insane. I've never seen anything like this. Um, and then what is the most we've ever seen that in any given year? Well, we've never seen more than three golfers out of the 1 to 20 course history range um, 
finished inside the top 10. So usually we see 8.57 per year. We only have six this year. Yeah, I could see we're not going to get up to three. So those coming in with the absolute best course history, you don't want to play more than three golfers of those. Uh, and I mean, best course history is anything under 20. Now, when we look at 20 to 40, the most you want to play is four. Between 40 and 60, the most you want to play is five. Now, we can also see out of the entire bucket, what is the success rate? That's essentially what this is. And I, I should put success rate. Um, why don't we do that? I, I said this during the strategy video uh, with Nick during the uh, Masters tournament. Let's go ahead and put su success rate. This is 18.52% out of this bucket. How I look at that is since there is a minimum of one, that means we do want to play one of these guys for sure that falls in this bucket. 18.52, you could look at this a couple ways. This could be your maximum ownership of anybody who falls into that bucket. This could be your maximum ownership of, well, I wouldn't actually do for the entire bucket because we can see it happens at least once every year. I'm pretty confident it's going to do it again. Um, so I think that's probably how I would do it. It's 18.52%. Uh, of six golfers, that means... You know, I, I usually like to divide this number into that 18.52 just to get how many golfers we should choose. So I guess let me do that. So 18.52 divided by six. Three golfers. So no, that's not how we do that. We don't do it that way. We go 16 times 0 0.1852. 1.11. So definitely want to play one guy. Uh, I am i don't know how many I'm going to play of two or three. But if we were to go and look at our best course history, guys. So we're looking at everybody from Dylan Fratelli up. You want to play at least one of those guys in your lineup. Which is kind of fun, right? So... It's your pick between Patrick Cantley, Sergio Garcia, JT Poston, Matt Kuchar, Ian Poulter, or Dylan Fratelli. Um, I guess what we could do is just go less than or equal to 20. Of these guys, who has the most top 10s? It's Matt Kuchar with four. 100% cut made percentage for all of these guys. The next guy is Patrick Cantlay. Then JT Poston with a 6th and an 8th place. Now JT Poston probably is the value pick here out of this entire group. Ian Poulter with two uh, top 10s. A 54th is his worst finish. If we take that out, he's down to 12 as an average finishing position. So not terrible. Um, and then Sergio with a 5th place finish last year. Now that was in June. So, you know, if we take all of this out, we can see who has the best average finishing position. Uh, it's Patrick Cantlay, followed by JT Poston, which only had one finish here before, uh, and then Matt Kuchar. Sergio, you know, you, you might be able to just to cast him out because last year was a little bit, a little bit different than typical years. Uh, and he just missed the cut at the Masters. I don't know how that's going to fare, but we can obviously take a look with the buckets going forward. So out of this range, pick, you know, you, you want to pick one. Now, if we go back to that summary, look at our twos. We want to pick somewhere between one to five. And our twos are that 40 to 60 range. So let's go ahead and into course history and look 40 to 60. So I'll go in between 40 and 60. And, I mean, if we look at our summary, how many golfers do we have in this bucket? We have 49. So it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And, and on average, we have 38. So I guarantee you we're going to see one, if not two, out of this out of this bucket. And, again, I guess I could go 49 times 7.27. Just to get a number, 3.5. So, obviously, the max is 5. Perhaps we should be looking for around three to four golfers out of this bucket. Now, I don't know who your favorite guys are out of here, but if I were to sort by top top tens, 
which it obviously, it's already sorted that way. Russell Knox, Troy Merritt, Brian Harmon, Kevin Na, Billy Horschel, Michael Thompson, Jim Furyk, and that's it. Those golfers right there, those seven golfers have two top tens um, in here. And neither one of them has a 100% cut made percentage. I guess if we wanted to look there, you know, Harry Higgs has one event here. These guys probably aren't the greatest to go by. Maybe we look at events played two or greater. And we only have one guy. Wyndham Clark is the only guy who's played two events or more out of this bucket uh, to actually make the cut each time. And 64th and 54th place, not the great. Not not great at all. Um, so it's a hard bucket to choose from. Your best uh, course history from this, Bryce Garnett and Russell Knox. So Russell Knox might be on the short list for me. Brian Harmon would come in second. That's crazy. Matthew Fitzpatrick has played this tournament a ton. Hasn't finished better than 14th. Um, two missed cuts in 2017, 2016. I would say he's probably a little bit better than than he was in 2017, 2016. So not terrible. Abe Answer with a missed cut in 2019, but a second place last year. Again, last year it's hard to quantify because it was during a, a different month where the... the uh, um, the conditions were probably more pristine, I would assume. So it's hard to go with that. I like Charlie Hoffman. Uh, missed cut here last year. So yeah, I I think this one's probably a little bit more difficult to choose from. I'll scroll through this. You guys can pause to see who all the other players are. But it is right now sorted by best course history going down. So I'll go down to Camillo. Again, I want to select probably three golfers from this group. I really like Chris Kirk. Uh, and not the greatest, actually, with course history. And this will round out your golfers in this. Notable here, Russell Henley. I do like Russell Henley, but two missed cuts the last couple of years. Uh, one top 10, so that's not terrible, but it's also not good. All right, so I don't want to go through all of the buckets within course history, but I did go through one. and or Actually, I went through four. I did not select one. Maybe we gotta maybe we should look at our ones. Our ones and yeah, ones and threes. I guess we'll go through both. So those coming in with absolutely no course history. Um actually no 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 no. We want peas. And we want is blank. Cameron Davis, Doug Gim. Uh, here, let's go by alphabetical cam Davis, will Gordon. I'm Doug Gim. I'm only going to highlight the guys that I think are notable. Tom Lewis, Robbie McIntyre, Chase Seifert, Lee Westwood, Will Zalatoris. Um, now the buckets say to pick two as a minimum four as a maximum, but we usually see 27 golfers in this bucket. We only see 16 this year. So I think the min and the max can drop. So I would definitely say somewhere between one to two. And we can take this number, 16, and we can actually do quick math. 10% is easy. You just move over the decimal place. So 1.6. So we're looking between one to two guys we want to choose from this bucket. I mean, Doug Gim seems like a good choice. I don't mind putting like uh, a Zalatoris Westwood lineup together or having one of these two guys and then going to any of these guys since they're going to be lower priced. I think that's decent. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the last one. It's going to be 20 to 40. That is not 20 to 40. And for here, when we look at our summary, 20 to 40 is our course history three bucket. One was the min, four was the max. We usually see 20 in this bucket uh, average per year, but we see 23 this year. And even, this is our best bucket to finish inside the top five as well. So not terrible. So 12.61 into 23 is going to be a, a pretty high number. So 23 times 0 0.1261, 2.93. So basically three. So choose up to three guys. I think that's a safe bet. So when we do come and look at our course history, let's go ahead and look at our top 10. Actually, let's look at cut made percentage first. So 
a ton of guys here with 100% cut made percentage. We have 18 of them. Of those 18, let's get rid of one finish. So three or more. Starts with Webb Simpson, believe it or not. Goes up to Daniel Berger. Uh, but yeah, Berger, Wesley Bryan, who's also won this tournament. Dylan Fratelli, Brennan Grace, DJ, Dustin Johnson, Satoshi Kodaira, uh, Andrew Landry, William McGirt. You can see the rest of the guys up there. Uh, really interesting is Webb Simpson, obviously. Dustin Johnson, Daniel Berger. Those are your three really standout names there. Um, but it is also worth noting DJ's never finished top 10 at this tournament. Of these guys here, the most top 10s actually belong to Luke Donald. I'm not playing him. William McGirt, who has been hurt for quite a bit um, for like the last couple of years. That's why you don't see him in 2019, 2020. Three top 10s, 100% cut made percentage. Maybe worth a play? I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. But then Webb Simpson is up there. So out of this, this bucket, Webb is definitely your elite golfer, despite Dustin Johnson being in it and Daniel Berger. But it's it's the most top tens, hundred percent cut made percentage, uh, better worst finish than these guys. No, maybe not Dustin Johnson. But again, DJ is not finished top ten here. So that's all I'm going to talk about course history. That ran a lot longer than I intended it to. Um, I guess what I could do is sort by average, and we can scroll down a little bit. Obviously, pause it and take a look. So, with that, we can move on and go to our recent form. So, when we look at our recent form buckets, our number one bucket is between 40 and 60. Now, we usually see 43 golfers in that bucket, 42 this year. So, pretty much on par. Uh, we've seen as, as less, or it's hard kind of saying these words. At, at the least amount, we haven't seen anything less than one. That's all I want to say. We have not seen uh, any year where this bucket didn't show up less than one time. Um, so it, it's happened at least once. Maximum, nine times. Obviously, we, we can only build a lineup with six golfers in it. So this nine isn't really relevant, but it's also there to show you. At most, we've seen nine times inside the top 10. This bucket, nine times inside the top 10. And that's the recent form average between 40 and 60. Um, our number two buckets, 60 to 80. And we see one to eight. You know, haven't seen less than one any given year and haven't seen more than eight. 7.69% success rate, so not, not the greatest. This is an interesting bucket. Our third bucket here is that 20 to 40 recent form average. A minimum of two. So we've not seen this less than twice. We've seen it. Oh, man. I got I to gotta remember how to say this. We've seen it at least twice every single year, dating back to 2013. And at most, fit, five times. 11.68% success rate. Uh, and then we can also look at bucket four because it's that one to 20. So the best recent form coming in. We've actually seen this happen zero times before. So where, where nobody out of this bucket shows up inside the top 10. We usually only see 5.14 uh, per year, but we have nine this year. So I guarantee you we're going to see one from this bucket as well. It also has the highest frequency of finishing inside the top five. So the, the, the success rate of finishing inside the top five is pretty good. And I, I forget to mention that there are cut made percentages over here. Uh, definitely want to keep that in mind. But if we do go look at, and look at our recent form averages and we sort by best recent form down, out of this group, I said we're probably going to find one. So Will Zalatoris, Paul Casey, Cameron Smith, Corey Connors, Charlie Hoffman, Matthew Fitzpatrick, Colin Morikawa. Good luck selecting one of these guys. Uh, and I wouldn't say you only have to select one. Obviously, the summary says you can select a max of two. Do we see three in there? Maybe. I don't think so. But if there was ever a way to try to limit you on grabbing more of these guys, it would be the bucket system. So... Bucket system says don't play more than two. This could be the year we see three because there's obviously some good golfers in it, but that's at your risk. So I would not play four. Don't play four of these guys. Um, 
and you might not even be able to because everyone is pretty highly priced but the 20 to 40 range so chris kirk this is actually uh, not a not terrible 22 golfers in this one yep 22 we on average see 22 this is our third ranked bucket uh this is your min of two your max of five so it's probably a good uh, we're probably going to see at least two guys come from this bucket to finish inside the top 10 um chris kirk abram answer webb simpson i guess we could put sung jay siwoo kim emiliano grillo tyrell hatton Do we put Shane Lowry? I, I don't care to play Shane, Shane Lowry. Yeah, I just highlighted eight golfers in this group. They're your higher price golfers, your better golfers. Um, maybe it's worth anchoring your lineups around them. Pick two golfers from here. And maybe just one of the guys I selected and maybe one that's cheaper. It's not terrible. Not a te terrible way to go. Uh, this 40 to 60 range is pretty large. I think I said, yeah, it's average is 43. We see 42 this year. So this is definitely a volume driven bucket, but 11.92% success rate is pretty high. That That's really good for a bucket like that. So we are going to see somewhere between 11 to nine. And if we do the math here, it's, it's around four golfers out of this bucket you're going to want to choose from. Now it's up to four. You don't have to choose four. But when we do look at everyone in this bucket, um, Again, it's this 40 to 60, so it's from Chess and Hadley down. Daniel Berger falls in here. Russell Henley, Sebastian Munoz, Matt Wallace, Tommy Fleetwood, Lee Westwood, Sergio, I forgot to mention him, Doug Gim, Robert McIntyre, Billy Horschel. Uh, this list is pretty good. There's a lot of good golfers here. Pause the video if you want to see some of these other guys. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I already selected 10. Again, we could choose four, up to four of these guys. Um, yeah, I, I don't mind. The more and more I see Lee Westwood in these buckets that I've been talking about, like in the number one buckets, I kind of like the, the possibility of Westwood doing well. And at 8,300, it's kind of a discount if you look at him from previous tournaments. It's not terrible. Um, looking at our third bucket. No, we already went through our third, so we went with the first. Second bucket, 60 to 80. There's 45 in there. This is going to be a little bit more tricky, a little bit more difficult to kind of go through, but it's everybody that's highlighted in this red color. Streelman, I like. Carlos Ortiz might be a good uh, bounce back. Weird to see Dustin Johnson here, but don't be alarmed. This is actually, you know, the second ranked bucket for course history or for recent form, I'm sorry, for recent form. So not a terrible play from here. Um, a bunch of 6K guys that you could probably fill out your lineups with, like Doc Redman obviously has good course history. He's also in this recent form bucket, so that's not terrible. Benny Ann, 6,900, a pretty good value. Cameron Davis I like. Obviously hasn't been doing well previously, but maybe this is where he bounces back. Um, yeah, I don't know who else I'm going to talk about here. A lot of low price guys. And then our, I want to talk about this right here because we have Patrick Cantley in this group. So in that 80 and above, we have Cantley, Wyndham Clark, Sam Burns, everyone's favorite. Even Wesley Bryan is in this group. And I, I do like Wesley Bryan, but if we look at the summary for this bucket, that's this bucket here. We, don't, we never see more than one. And we actually only have one instance where this has happened um, dating back to 2013. Now, I don't know what quality of golfers were in this bucket, but only seeing one, probably not a good sign for someone like uh, Patrick Cantley. And when we come to the cut made percentage, 31.94%. Um, I think it's probably not a good time to play Patrick Cantley. Um, just my, my two cents. Um, I think that's where I might end this because we are already at 50 minutes. This was not my fastest uh, preview that I that I wanted. I I want to go over last year and last week. I usually do in these videos, but I think it makes sense to just tackle the DK page tomorrow because that's the only way that I'm actually going to be able to show you guys who these buckets are and going through them. I 
I don't know, maybe, well, I have to go over grass stats. That's definitely one thing we need to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, so I, I do have POA stats here. Uh, this is not correct. So we're going to go ahead and remove this. What I'm going to do is kind of what I do in a lot of my review videos is give you the top 20 within the grass stat that is chosen. So it goes down to Will Gordon. Obviously, he's a little off screen when I scroll up and down. But your number one golfer for overall POA would be Dustin Johnson. Paul Casey comes in second. Patrick Cantley comes in third. We just talked about him. Again, he's in that recent form bucket five. Probably not the you know a play, a guy to go with, but... You know, maybe it's, this is the way that another or one more golfer gets in that bucket. Again, we've only seen one. So, not, I don't know. Tyrrell Hatton's up there. I do like Tyrrell Hatton this week. Matt Kuchar. You can see the rest of the guys here. Um, I would say, you know, screenshot this if you want this for your own personal use. One of the other things I like to talk about is um, top 10 percentage. Usually what I want to do is find golfers who have 5% or better, and this is their frequency of finishing inside the top 10 at a POA event, you can see I have 0% for Lee Westwood, which is very, very interesting. So let me go ahead and sort this from 0% and on. Um, some of these guys have very few events under their belt, so any of this dark red kind of tells you that they haven't played that much, so you could probably give a little bit of an excuse to but like Lee Westwood, 41.48. Obviously, he's been on tour for a while or he's been playing on tour events. This is dating back to 2013, this number, overall POA. So he has a track record of not playing very well on POA golf courses. Now, again, this was Bermuda. So I don't have the Bermuda stats. I should say it's typically Bermuda. But this year, obviously, it's overseed with POA. I don't know how I feel about that. When we look at the rest of the guys with 0%, Doug Gim shows up. Camilo Vijegas shows up. Um, I mean, Doug Gim only has 12 events that have POA. So that's really interesting um, that, you know, a California, I think he's from California. I think he played at Texas, but I think he's from California. It's, hold on, I can, I can double check. Oh, he's from Nevada. So never mind. And played at Texas. So, yeah, not a lot of POA uh, tournaments on there. So, obviously, he does well on Bermuda, I'm guessing. Um, even JT Poston shows up here. And I'm guessing that's because the, the year he won it, I don't have it as POA, I'm guessing. If that's the case, I think we could probably just skip past this because I know in 2018 I don't have um, the golf course marked as POA. Oh, he didn't win this tournament. I was, I was, I was mistaken. So he should have a sixth place finish. So he should have at least one. Um, I don't have it marked in 2019 as POA. So that's an issue. So obviously eighth place. I know he has six. I can probably go by course history and whether or not they finish in top ten here. Abe answer with a second place finish last year. That was Bermuda for last year, for sure. But yeah, anybody that's from here up. So basically, I would say Rory Sabatini. I'm going to include him. But Abe answer falls under that under that category. At 8,900. Um, Cameron Davis, Corey Connors shows up, and Lee Westwood. Those four golfers, most notable. And, and I mean, I guess we got to include Doug Gim in there as well. So five golfers, really? Yeah, I don't mean to actually select all of these guys. I want to just talk about um, Abram Anser. I guess Alex Norin also fit, fits that, fits in there. Now, these guys are all capable of finishing inside the top 10. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that they haven't with as many events under their belt gives you a good indication that they're not a strong play to choose from. The other, the last piece of uh, basically grass stats I want to cover is the Pete Dye stats. I said I was going to do that earlier in the video. That's why we're here. 
That's why I'm doing it. Um, your best die specialist right now is, is Will Zalatoris, but he only has one event under his belt. Um, so we can skip that. We can also skip past uh, Chase Seifert, who has a 25% top 10 uh, Pete die percentage or frequency of finishing inside the top 10. That's pretty good. Um, but this is pretty telling. Sergio Garcia, Matt Kuchar, Patrick Cantley, Dustin Johnson, Fleetwood, Casey, um, I guess Poulter, Westwood, and Daniel Berger. These are all notable names for me to mention. Oh, Webb Simpson. What am I doing? Webb is another guy. And you can see all of their top 10 percentages as well. Pretty darn good. Now, I don't really so much look at the 0 to 5% when it comes to Pete Dye golf courses. There aren't a lot of them. So, obviously, the guys that have like 1 to 5 events under their belt, probably not a good indication. But someone like a Brian Stewart, that's pretty good. 34 events. Average finishing position is 56.79. 2.94% chance of finishing inside the top 10. Not very good. Um, and that kind of goes down all of these guys here. Jim Herman. Malnati, Swafford, Taylor, Reeve, Johnson, CH3. Probably not good, not, not guys to go go with that much. Same goes with Carlos Ortiz, Sebastian Munoz. Um, again, Wyndham Clark is there. Chris Kirk. Man, that kind of stinks. I, I do like Chris Kirk this week, but seeing that kind of is a little disappointing. Um, if I were to go and look at 2020 DK, and this is my, my DK page for 2020, this is going to have those grass stats here as well. If I do look at Pete Dye, Tyrrell Hatton, who had eight events under his belt with 0% top 10 percentage, he did finish inside the top 10. So he was one guy that was able to break out of that mold, but you can see everyone else I guess Dylan Fratelli is another guy. He had four events under his belt at 0%, finished inside the top 10. But everyone else had 5% or greater. So obviously, if you try to select golfers with 5% or greater, it's going to help you out a little bit more. Again, Bermuda percentage was up there. And you can see everybody but, say, Abram Answer had 5% or greater. And I feel like this is a common trend throughout most tournaments. If I go to 2019, yeah, I had Bermuda stats, uh, which is unfortunate. Probably shouldn't have. If we hide all this, oh, I don't have the, I do have the top 10 percentage for Pete Dye. Oh, I do have it for Bermuda as well. So 0% Shane Lowry. I don't have the amount of events that he's he was here for Pete Dye. Him and Sam Burns, really the only guys, and I guess Michael Thompson technically, were the only guys that had less than 5% that finished inside the top 10. Uh, and then JT Poston. KJ Choi, he's not, yeah, he was inside the top 10. Again, this should have been POA if I were to redo this. But you can see that 0% still is pretty relevant. Um, so of the golfers I just showed you with 0%, take your risk on selecting those guys. I personally would think, I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to reduce their ownership when I, when I select lineups. Uh, and I think that's probably the best way to do it. So yeah, this is already running at an hour long. What I'm going to do is include the last year and last week buckets in next in the next video, in the strategy video, um, which I will also include the strokes game buckets. And that will round out the bucket system. Um, I think what I'm going to have to do is go back to the drawing board and, and think of how to do this because that was a lot longer than I wanted it to be. Um, when I replay this back, obviously I'll get a, a good idea of how to, to do this better. Maybe it's just going and just telling you, you know, just by summary, you know, bucket one, we want to select golfers who did not play one to 20 and miss cuts. And then look at the golfers that do have those stats and then move on as quick as possible. But I don't know. I want you guys to sound off in the comment section. Did you like how this was formatted? Um, if not, let me know. I am, I'm not set really on one way or another. I just want to show you guys the data. That's all that matters to me. Uh, show you where you shouldn't spend too much of your time and where you should spend more of your time. Um, that's the whole goal 
of any of these videos I do, whether it's the preview or the strategy or even the review, which obviously goes over this whole process. Um, it's really giving you guys the information and letting you guys decide what to do. But I do want to make these faster, so hopefully in the future I can do that. But let's try to end this right at an hour. I say it's over a couple seconds. But anyways, thank you guys for watching. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And we'll see you in the strategy video tomorrow. All right, bye.